Our second scripture reading is found in Luke chapter 12, verses 42 through 48. I invite you to share in this reading. And may God's blessing fall upon the reading and the hearing and the understanding of these words. And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise steward, whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, My master is delayed in coming, and begins to beat the men servants and the maid servants, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect, and at an hour he does not know, and will punish him and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not make ready or act according to his will shall receive a severe beating. But he who did not know and did what deserved the beating shall receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much is given, of him will much be required. And of he to whom men commit much, they will demand the more. We know these words to be trustworthy and true. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray this hour that you would pour into me the gift of preaching and that you would pour into your church a hunger and a thirst to be fed by your word. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Now, don't worry, I'm not condoning uh, Jesus coming back and beating us in case we're bad stewards. That's a pretty hard parable. Well, friends, this is the third of, of a four sermon uh, well, four-week sermon series based on the topic of stewardship. And if you remember, I'm sure you memorize every word I say, but just in case, I'm going to recap for us here. The word steward has been around for a long time. Most of us were raised with it. Some of us weren't. The word actually is a feudal uh, times old European word uh, that was used um, it was, it was a normal word on the street. Everyone knew what it meant back then. And during the feudal system, you had, if you remember, you had on top of the system was a lord of any given parcel of land, usually the size of about a county. And underneath the lord were the masses. They were called peasants. Ninety-five, ninety-eight percent of the population were peasants. And then you had this top royal group. Well, just in between the two and underneath the lord was a person who was tasked with the responsibilities, with handling the Lord's responsibilities. Uh, They were tasked with uh, uh, making sure everyone was fed on the lower caste system, that everyone was protected militarily. Uh, They were the economic advisors of the Lord. And the person who had this name was called the county's steward. Steward is an old English term. And when they were creating and writing one of the most popular versions of the Bible, the King James Version of the Bible in 1611, They were looking around and said, which word would fit best in these parables that Jesus uses? The word Jesus uses for servant and steward is oikonomos. And and they said, for that word, what what would fit best for our modern? Back then, you know, King James Version was modern at one point. They said, what word fits best? And they said, steward. They said, steward fits best because the, the position that Jesus is talking about is a position of honor. It's a position of responsibility. It's, it's a great uh, position to be in, to receive from the Lord and to do his uh, work on his behalf. So that's where the word steward came from, and so that's where we started the series, is recognizing that to be called a steward isn't, when the preacher stands up and starts talking about steward, it's not a chance to roll your eyes and say, here we go again, get your checkbooks hidden. Uh, it's actually, a, it's, a, it's an honorable position. It's a great um, situation to be in. And the one thing I really pushed on our first sermon is to recognize that the, the, the one discipline a steward could not uh, slip up on was no matter how trustworthy the steward was and how diligent and wise, and, and you wouldn't be a steward unless you were wise and diligent, trust me. Most people don't hire you to take care of their things unless they trust you. But even if you were trustworthy, some stewards would slip up and they would get fired immediately and actually thrown into prison by doing one thing, and it's easy to do they would slip up and start acting like the Lord's things were theirs. 
Instead of just guarding them, instead of just using them, distributing them to the needy, and deploying them to those who, for their best use, bad stewards would start using them for their own, uh, for gluttonous uh, acts. They would use them uh, just to make themselves comfortable. They would stop using them for their intended service. So that's where we started, is to recognize that as stewards, our first job is to make sure, uh, for us, of course, the Lord is the Lord. That's obvious, right? The Lord is the Lord. God is the Lord. Jesus is our Lord. And everything that we have received is from him. And it's our job to steward them well. So it's, that's an important thing to grasp. Last week, we touched on the, on the portion of tithe. We have a nice slice of pie here on the altar for us today. Thanks, Jim. And the, the tithe is, is not the meat of stewardship. Tithing is important. But the meat of stewardship we're going to get to today. Tithing is returning 10% of God's things back to God. And it's important, uh, last week I I touched on two reasons that I've heard preached over and over again that I think are unbiblical and and flat out uh, dangerous at times uh, about the tithe. And the first one that that I'd like us to just set aside this season as we're talking about stewardship is is the reason that, that, uh, that I've heard preached is that people believe that God needs your money. Okay, God doesn't need our money, okay? Uh, to, to, uh, to believe that God needs our money would, would, first off, downgrade the power, the authority, the ability of God to provide. You know, God, if you remember, was just fine before he made us. Uh, God doesn't need our money. Uh, and, and in fact, to believe that God needs our money puts stewardship on its head. It's saying that it's ours, and we want God to be our steward. That's backwards from the situation. And so please don't tithe like God needs to borrow a dollar from you. Does that make sense? God doesn't need our money. Number, the number two reason I've heard preached of why we should tithe, that I, I'd like us to set aside, and it's not a bad reason, it's just not the core reason to tithe. People have been told, and I've heard it before, that we should tithe so that we can keep our doors uh, of the church open, so that we can make budget. We're having these home meetings, these 18 home meetings in people's homes, and I hope you don't hear that in these meetings, that we need you to give to keep the church doors open. Because that's not the reason you tithe. Now, that's a great symptom of tithing. Please, as an employee of the church, by all means, continue to tithe. But don't tithe so that you can receive a service. Don't tithe just to support something you love. Now, supporting things you love financially is great. But the tithe is something different. That's something unique in our faith walk. The number one reason to tithe, if you remember, is that God wants access to your, your heart. That's it. He wants, that's, I'm going to sum up all of Christianity right here. God wants your heart. And he's going to get your heart in several ways. He's going to get it through prayer. He's going to get it through coming to his table, through, through loving your neighbor, through loving him. He, he will also get it through your finances. Jesus is the one that said, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. He knew that there is a hidden link, a connection between, an emotional connection between our, our checkbooks, our, our bank accounts, our retirement, and our hearts. Don't believe me? What were you feeling in 2008 when the market crashed? <clears throat> and on, when you're having a great windfall year, you can't help but feel undergirded and happy. There's, it's not a bad thing. There's a connection emotionally between the things that we've been entrusted to financially in our hearts. Does that make sense? Number one reason to tithe is to give God access to your heart. The number two reason to tithe is that it serves as a constant, you know, 10% is a lot, y'all. It serves as a, as a constant, almost painful reminder that everything that you're going to go home and steward this afternoon, it's God's. It's a noticeable reminder. It's a noticeable reminder that, that we are not going to go home and pretend that the Lord's things are ours because that's the one thing a steward can't do, remember? You can't slip up there. So that's the, basic of the basis of the ties that fits in within stewardship. And today's sermon is based on the meat and potatoes of stewardship how to manage everything else God gives you. Now, I could literally preach that topic all year and not cover everything, so that's not what I'm going to try to do today. I'm going to touch on the basic elements, the basic uh, principles of of good stewardship heading home, and it's not just financial. So here's the situation. God is the, we're going to, as stewards, what we choose to do is humble ourselves and let God be God. We let God be the owner, let God be the provider, let God be the, the, the wisdom giver. And it's our job to pray, to work hard, and to receive. We've been training our son from the very beginning, a Christian, where does money come from? He'll give you two quick answers if you ask him, from Jesus and from work. So, uh, you know, work hard, pray hard, and let God give to us. So that's great. That's, jobs, that's God's job is to be God. Our job is, is to just merely receive from God and steward what he gives us. It's a pretty sweet deal. 
It's pretty sweet. But there's one thing we have to, after receiving from God, there's one principle we have to touch on, we have to deal with regularly. And it's, it's something that most of us do subconsciously, automatically. It's something we uh, don't really sit on. And I'm going to ask us to actually sit on it this week. In the parable written today, and all throughout the stewardship principle, parables that Jesus tells, he uses the word over and over and over, the word entrust. You have been entrusted. I have been entrusted with this pulpit to preach today. You have been entrusted with the children you are to raise. Does this make sense? You've been handed these things. And when you're entrusted with something, you have to make a determination. You have to discern what that word means for each given resource. Because to be entrusted with one thing has a different purpose than with another thing. And I'll give you an example. If I gave Jan the the diamond ring I was going to use to ask to beg Valerie to marry me with, and I entrust it to you, Jan, and I need to go do something, and I'm out of pocket, and where I can't take a ring with me, and I'm going to come back and ask you for it. And I say, Jan, I entrust you with this ring to ask Valerie to marry me. And I come back, and I've discovered, you've got a smile on your face, and I've discovered that you went and you sold the ring for what it's worth, and you went to Vegas and you doubled the money. Okay? And you're all excited to say, look what you entrusted me with, right? I would be so mad at you, wouldn't I? Because I bought that ring and gave it and trusted it to you so that I could hand it over to Valerie. You interpreted the word entrust to mean to use its value to produce even more value. That's actually in the scriptures when Jesus reprimands people. He says, you know, I gave you talents, I gave you things to use, and you buried them. But in this case, with the diamond ring, it's obvious that I've entrusted it to Jan as a, to use it like a time capsule, just to keep it, okay? Now let's say, uh, let's say I, I, I come back uh, to a different scenario, and... Uh, and, and, I, and I hand over uh, Jerry. Jerry and I are going to go into battle together. We're soldiers on the same team, and we're fighting a common enemy. And I've got, I've got a couple of rifles, and I give Jerry my best rifle. My best rifle. It, it, it shoots perfectly. The scope set is great. But I trust him with it more than I trust myself for some reason. So here you go. I've entrusted it to you. And let's say after the battle, I can't find Jerry anywhere during the battle. And after the battle, Jerry comes up to me with a big smile on his face and says, I, I, I buried your rifle and I kept it nice and safe because I knew how much you cared about it. Here you go. I'd be so upset with Jerry because I gave Jerry one of my best tools to use in the battle. When I gave him and entrusted it to him, I assumed that he would understand I wanted him to use it, not preserve it. Does that make sense? We have to make a determination with every resource we've been handed, every, entrusted with, what that word means with each and every resource. And sometimes we don't think about it. Sometimes we just roll with it. And a lot of bad stewardship happens when we don't ask ourselves that question. Why have I been entrusted with this? Lori Wilson was raised medically from the dead. And one of the things Wade and Lori and I and our church have been asking is, why did the Lord entrust us with that miracle? What are we supposed to do with that miracle. Share it. Tell, tell it to other people. Use it as an affirmation. Every single thing we're given has purpose behind it. It's making sense. Every single thing that we've been given has a purpose, has a meaning behind it. And so that's our job with every resource we have from, from, uh, from abilities. You know, you're, you have an ability right now, most of us, that, that, uh, that is actually temporary. That's the ability to speak. Some people don't have that ability. You have been given the ability to speak entrusted to you. It's very temporary. Trust me, you will be silenced at one point. At some day, you'll be silenced. You've been entrusted with this ability, and you have to sit on it for a moment and ask the Scriptures, Lord, you've given me this ability. What have you given it to me for? What's its original intent? What's its use? I'll give you one. St. James and St. Paul both teach to proactively use your speech to bless others, to build others up, to encourage each other. Don't sit on that gift. So every single gift you've been given from your marriage, men, your job, entrusted with a good wife, is to bring out the best in her, dress her in dazzling white silk with every word and gesture you do. Every entrustment you have has meaning behind it. It's all important. Of course, today I get to talk about finances. Giving God back 10% of God's stuff, you're not done. When we go home and we look at all the finances God gives us, we have to ask ourselves, why did God give us, trust us with this money, with his money? What am I supposed to do with God's money? And usually it's a blend of several things. 
You're to use it to glorify his name. You're to use it to, to help other people who are down on their luck. You're to use it to enjoy it. You know, God actually wants you to enjoy your life. You're to use it, you're to use it in ways that, that, that support people you love. And every month, Valerie and I have this great, uh, uh, it's a fun time to sit down and intentionally steward God's things. We sit down and, and at the beginning or at, at the end of each month, before the month begins, we sit down and we get to write the number that we're used to receiving from God. We could be surprised any day. You know what that's like. But we write down the, the number of money, we're, the amount of money we're used to seeing each month from the hand of God. We write it at the top of the page. We write the word tithe and we hand God 10% back on paper. We end up executing it in a little bit, don't worry. We write down the tithe and that's a hard reminder that every single thing that God's given us is his, not ours. And so we give God back 10%. Then we list every single thing we think God ought to is asking us to use his money for this month. For food, for shelter, for helping other people. And so by the time you get down to ice cream and cookies, to red box, to going on a date, you get to intentionally say, we believe that God's okay with us using $50 of his cash for our fun. And we go down that list and we write the amounts. And go down the list and we write that amounts and say, this cash that God's given to us has been given to us with a purpose and it's our job to diligently execute this stewardship and at the end of each month whether or not we like it we are standing before God saying this is what we did with your money and our hope our hope our prayer is that God's pleased with us don't we all hope for that that God's pleased with what we're doing that the way we spend God's money matches our values the way we spend God's things matches our priorities the things we find important that's not just a saying that we can tell what we care about by the way we spend our time and the way we spend God's money. That's actually a true statement. Believe it or not, this stewardship focus isn't about fundraising for the church. That's not my job. (laughs) This stewardship focus is about getting the best stewardship out of our households, out of our folks in the church, to be good, good, uh, trustworthy managers of the things God gives you and the things God gives me. And I long for our congregation, I long to hear several things. I long to, to experience several things. I long, number one, is I want to see all of y'all in heaven. You know that, right? I look forward to our, you know, we're going to be in a relationship forever. Sorry about that. We're going to be in a relationship forever. I look forward to that. That's number one. Number two, I'd love to see our congregation experience a great rebirth in, new, in numbers. I'd love to see our congregation experience miracles, power, the word of God. But on top of that list, in addition to all these things, I'd also like each and every one of us to hear. At the end of our lives, we step up to that pearly gate, we wait for it to open, and we are greeted with one clean, crisp statement. Well done. Well done, my good and my faithful servant. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. We pray through your name, and we pray by your name, Father, to the, to the Father of all creation. We ask that in, in your name, Father, Lord Jesus, that you would help us um, receive wealth from, from our, our, our Father. We pray that in your name, Jesus, that we would be granted wisdom on what it means to be entrusted with goods, that we would uh, have a clean and crisp vision from you on what we're supposed to use, every good gift you give us. We pray that you would find us worthy stewards, that as the Proverbs teach, we would be diligent that we would hunger after your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We pray, Lord, that you would be proud of us and that we would be uh, shown the way so that we would be greeted with good and faithful words upon our reception into your kingdom. We pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.